Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm uh, Dick Morningstar. I'm the founding chairman of the Global Energy Center here at the Atlantic Council, and I'm very pleased to welcome this huge crowd. I think it's uh, <clears throat> really, it's obviously an important topic today, but uh, it is July 31st, uh, and uh, this whole thing was planned with like six days notice. Uh, so um, this is actually quite a, uh, quite a turnout. And I want to thank uh, particularly Gray Johnson, the amazing Gray, who uh, uh, put, this, uh, put this together uh, for us. I also want to thank David Goldwyn, who uh, chairman of our energy advisory group, sitting over there, who I'll introduce again later as a member of the panel. But he's the one that uh, actually pushed us to do this now. <laughs> And, you know, when he got in touch with us uh, to say, gee, you know, we ought to do this, I was saying to myself, God, how are we going to do this on six days' notice and all this sort of thing in the middle of summer and so forth? And, well, in any event, we did. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we have a, a very distinguished group of, uh, of all of you as well as uh, speakers uh, for the event, which is titled Deterring Russia proposed sanctions legislation and implications for energy. And also I should mention that today highlights uh, the, also the cooperation uh, within the Atlanta Council uh, between the Global Energy Center, the Eurasia Center, and the Global Business and Economics Programs Economic Sanctions Initiative uh, on issues uh, related to sanctions. Uh, <clears throat> and as you all know, we're now coming through one year since CATSA was enacted um, on August 2nd last year, uh, the Countering America's Adversaries Through, Adversaries Through Sanctions Act of 2017. Uh, all of this legislation, as one of our panelists said earlier, is, giving, is doing wonders for the acronym industry. Uh, <clears throat> when we, particularly with all of the uh, uh, new legislation and so one year later, it's uh, time to talk about where is, uh, where is CATSA, but also to discuss uh, the several pieces of new legislation uh, which has been introduced in both, uh, in both the Senate and the House, um, and what does that mean, and, uh, um, and also the, I think the uncertainty uh, that it creates uh, looking out into the future as to what's going to happen with respect to our energy relationships uh, with Russia, both inside and outside of Russia, and also uh, on specific projects like the famous Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, <clears throat> having, uh, having said that, I think we can go right, I can go right to uh, introducing uh, our panelists. I mentioned David Goldwyn, um, who's the chairman of our energy advisory group. He's also a senior fellow with the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center and is the president of uh, Goldwyn Global Strategies. He's had uh, many positions in the U.S. government where I first, we first got to know each other, uh, including being the special envoy and coordinator for international energy affairs from 2009 to 11. Uh, we actually, there, David's a lawyer. We actually, we're full of lawyers today. Um, we have three lawyers, including David. We have uh, <coughs> Ted, I'm a lawyer too, so maybe we have four. Uh, Ted Cassinger, who's a, a partner at uh, O'Melveny, O'Melveny and Myers, where uh, he counsels U.S. and foreign clients engaged in transnational business transactions with an emphasis on uh, uh, trade and uh, investment regulatory matters. I don't think you probably want me to say how many years of private practice you've had, but <laughs> let's, <clears throat> let's just say he doesn't look like he's had the number of years of private practice that he's had. Um, <clears throat> and also David Mortlock, who actually, at the beginning of his career at O'Melveny and Myers, worked for, worked for Ted uh, before uh, he went to the uh, legal advisor's office. Uh, David uh, is a senior fellow with the Council's Global Energy Center and a partner and chair of the Global Trade and Investment Group at Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. And, uh, you know, I have this whole thing here about what you advise clients on, but it sounds like pretty much the same thing you adv <laughs> that Ted advises, and since he trained you way back when, you know. Uh, and then last but, not, uh, last but not least on the panel, we have uh, um, uh, Dalip Singh, who's a senior fellow with the Council's Global Business and Economics Program, chief economist at 
well, one more acronym, SPX USA, uh, <clears throat> and has served in several roles in the Treasury Department, and most recently as acting Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. And before joining Treasury, Dilip was with uh, Goldman Sachs in New York and London. And our panel will be moderated today by Megan Gordon. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Who's a senior editor at uh, S and P uh, Global Platts? Covers she covers federal energy policy, the oil market, um, and renewable fuels from Platts Newsroom in Washington. And she previously edited Asian Energy News in Tokyo, and has worked for newspapers across the U.S. So we have a great moderator. Um, I want to remind everybody: this is on the record. We're streaming live. It will be archived on the Atlantic. Council's YouTube channel. Uh, and so please join the conversation on uh, Twitter at uh, AC Global Energy using the hashtag AC Energy. And now I can turn it over to Megan. Thank you, Ambassador, and thanks for, for coming. Um, so we are two weeks um, two weeks away from the Helsinki Summit, and we have about half a dozen bills in Congress circulating, and we're going to try to make sense of those today. Um, we have the Deter Act um, that's been, that was sponsored way back in, or is introduced way back in January, but is being revived. Uh, that's by the Senators, uh, Senators Rubio and, and Van Hollen. Uh, Senators John Barrasso and Cory Gardner have an, a separate bill that looks at Nord Stream 2. Um, Bob Menendez and Lindsey Graham are working on a, another effort, and then there's also activity going on in the House. So let's, um, and, and just as a backdrop to um, the conversation, um, obviously Western sanctions were put in place on Russia um, going back to 2014, and as far as the energy sector goes, we haven't seen a big uh, impact on uh, export volumes or oil and gas production. Um, but we'll talk about what some of these proposals would do for those, um, as well as for the financial sector and, um, and debt markets. So let's, let's start with uh, Ted. Uh, can you walk us through what the bills say, uh, especially deter, which some are saying might be the you know, most likely vehicle um, right now. Um, so, so what are some of the different, the different um, what are some, some of the different proposals and what are they trying to accomplish? What's the main goal? Well, sure. Well, thank you. Uh, and very, <coughs> thank you, Dick, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, just one step back in terms of where these bills start from. So you have CATSA uh, last, well, actually going to the, in the beginning, uh, 2014 incursion into Crimea, Eastern Ukraine sanctions. Then uh, last August, CATSA uh, was enacted. Uh, CATSA had a number of secondary sanctioned provisions, and uh, secondary sanctions meaning threaten, uh, threats to impose sanctions on non-U.S. persons for doing certain kinds of business uh, with, in Russia or with Russian persons, uh, including in the energy sector. Uh, then uh, there was this, been a series of things over the last uh, few months. Uh, in January, a required report under CATSA naming you know, 400 oligarchs, uh, essentially. Uh, in March, imposition uh, by the president of uh, sanctions on a number of Russian nationals, designated them as specially designated nationals. Uh, some follow-up in April on that. <coughs> uh, and so this kind of sense of increasing sanctions. And then we had the July summit uh, with Presidents Trump and Putin. Uh, I'm sure uh, Many of you do not think of our president as a, as a scientist, um, but he does manage to demonstrate recurrently the, the principle that every action uh, creates an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, and so we had it, and uh, we've had it over the last 21 days, <laughs> basically. So not noticed by many people, but last January, Cong uh, Senator Van Hollen and Senator Rubio introduced uh, the deter bill, uh, feeding into the theme of acronyms. Uh, this bill, uh, which I'll go through in a second, uh, languished, I would say, uh, until about three weeks ago when it suddenly, uh, after the summit, uh, gained uh, 12 new 
co-sponsors. I noticed equally six Democrats, six Republicans on that bill, uh, and got started be becoming uh, in the news quite a bit. Uh, at the same time, Senator Barrasso uh, introduced a bill uh, over the last week uh, that <coughs> uh, the acronym for which is the ESCAPE Act. Uh, so can uh, think about what is, it's escaping from, but it's uh, a very short bill that's uh, targeted squarely at the Nord Stream 2 project, a gas project uh, from Russia to Europe. Uh, in the House, uh, uh, Leader uh, Hoyer, um, together with the Democratic uh, Caucus, put together about 30 existing separate bills having to do with uh, Russia, post-election interference uh, uh, issues, and they uh, so the, there's a newly introduced, uh, I think it's about 90-page bill in the House that has all the, these pieces of legislation in them. Uh, that has 38 co-sponsors, I think, 36 of whom are Democrats, but there are two Republicans on that bill. Uh, and there are other bills that are, have been floating around. In April, for example, Senator Gardner introduced a bill uh, that would essentially require the Secretary of State to designate Russia as a terrorism sponsor country. Uh, Senator Durbin uh, introduced a bill that would uh, forbid uh, uh, admissibility into the U.S. Uh, to uh, aliens who participated in, you know, uh, interfering in U.S. elections, and there are many variants of that. So quickly, I, I, you know, I think the conversation is, is mostly around the Barrasso and the uh, deter bills, and uh, let me just enumerate quickly what they're all about. Uh, the Barrasso bill, as I mentioned, basically does one thing, <coughs> and that says the president must impose secondary sanctions, five out of a menu of uh, various uh, penalties uh, against uh, persons, entities that uh, support the construction of an energy export pipeline from Russia. And it, it's very clear that it, it's, it's aimed at <coughs> Nord Stream 2, which uh, was not, which kind of escaped, to use a word, uh, the CATSA requirements uh, last August after a vigorous lobbying campaign by the European Union. Uh, but <coughs> in this case, it's, that's squarely what this bill is aimed at, uh, and uh, it would apply to anyone who invests above a certain level, or which is pretty low, a million dollars per investment, $5 million in a 12-month period, or uh, contributes goods, services, technology, et cetera, uh, to enhance the ability of Russia to build that pipeline. So very broad, uh, and uh, there'll be quite a number of foreign companies uh, that potentially could be targeted under that bill. The deter bill is <coughs> uh, much more uh, expansive. <coughs> uh, its premise is uh, interference in U.S. elections. It would require the DNI, uh, together with the director of the FBI and other uh, intelligence agencies, to issue a report on uh, foreign interference in a U.S. election, um, and more precisely, a report on Russian interference in, you know, pick a recent election. Uh, and if the uh, report finds that there was such interference, then the president is required to impose a uh, lengthy menu of um, blocking actions uh, on the uh, assets and businesses of persons that are described in various sections of the bill. Uh, some of this uh, is reminiscent of the sections of CATSA that identifies industries, so for example, the military or uh, intelligence sectors in the U.S., I, I'm, in, I'm sorry, in Russia. Uh, but it's quite expansive in other ways. For example, it would uh, block assets of uh, named Russian energy companies. Uh, it would impose sanctions on doing um, business with certain named Russian banks. Uh, it would uh, uh, prohibit transactions. Um, with uh, entities that are 
uh, not only state on certain state on enterprises, but 50% or more owned by those SOEs, or if their assets are in the United States, 20% or more owned. So for example, a joint venture in which a, a Russian entity has a 20% interest. Uh, so it's, it would be quite expansive, and not only foreign companies, but US companies could be easily touched by this as partners with US companies doing business. And the last thing I'll just note, uh, well, two, th two last things. One is, you know, what, what is election interference? Um, a couple things you'd imagine in terms of interfering with the, you know, uh, exercising the right to vote, but uh, one that caught, uh, before that <laughs> particularly caught my eye was simply the spreading of false information in the United States. So there may be any number of talking heads uh, <coughs> in the United States who would fit that definition, or even panelists at uh, association meetings. But uh, the most important thing is the uh, these are mandatory. If the finding is made, the, the, the threshold finding, that the sanctions are mandatory, the president must, and there's no national security waiver, as there often is, uh, for sanctions. So. The only way, apparently, these would go away is they're either suspended or terminated in either case after uh, the DNI certifies that there has been no uh, interference in a U.S. election uh, uh, two full, full, through two full presidential election cycles. So we would be talking today at least uh, for 10 years, right? Uh, or nine and a half years, uh, so uh, pretty draconian. Stop so there. we have, as you mentioned, that the the bill, Deter bill, names specific companies, um, and then the Barrasso bill is obviously very pointed at at one project, Nord Stream <coughs> Two. Um, just to name the companies on the energy side um, that are in the bill, you've got Gazprom, Rosneft, and Luke Oil, um, and um, and it also talks about you know writing a report about the um, the uh, the biggest energy companies in Russia down the line um, if those change, but um, so. So David, um, with how does that compare, a very specific focus on certain companies, how does that compare to what was put in place in 2014 with sectoral sanctions? And um, is the, additionally, since CATSA, we haven't seen anybody be prosecuted or these sanctions, uh, in the US go after anybody for, for violating these sanctions. So it, would the US be willing to back up these current, this current uh, wave of sanctions? Sure, absolutely. Um, well, there's uh, a, lot, a lot is the same and a lot is different um, between where we were in 2014. I think the big difference that we've seen is essentially the, uh, the purpose behind the measures. Um, in, in 2014, um, to get a little nostalgic, uh, Dilip, Dilip and I spent a lot of time in windowless rooms uh, thinking through the options of, you know, it, it is a real challenge. How do you sanction uh, uh, such a large uh, globally interconnected economy? And I think, you know, someone had done the math and uh, Russia was five times larger than all the other economies we'd have ever sanctioned ever, collectively. Uh, and so there were real risks to there being spillover. And so, you know, you'll remember the sectoral sanctions. The reason that, um, you know, the smart economists in the room uh, proposed those was they thought about what the impact would be and work backward. How to put pressure on Putin's decision making. How to change his calculus over decisions in Crimea, in eastern Ukraine. And the, the reasoning was, with the, uh, the uh, directives one through three at least, was let's put pressure on access to financing in order to necessitate these companies turning to the central bank, which puts pressure on the ruble uh, and uh, obviously then potentially increases inflation and, and puts greater pressure on uh, Russian state finances. And, and Dilip can explain that much better than, than I can. Um, but, uh, uh, and then work backwards to create the directives and to choose the financial institutions, uh, the energy companies, the technology companies uh, that would be most effective if put under these restrictions to achieving that stated goal. Um, also, there's another element of, of course, what can we do with the Europeans that the Europeans will go along with in order to make them the most effective uh, possible. Um, I think uh, a couple of things have happened. Obviously, the let's work with the Europeans piece has, has 
fallen by the wayside. Um, but the other thing has happened is, from looking at these measures, it seems that, to me at least, that the, the, the implicit purpose of the, uh, in many cases, the stated purpose of these measures is to respond to the president's comments on Russia, to uh, force the president's hand to demonstrate U.S. <coughs> opposition to Russia's actions, right? It, it is not so much how do we put pressure on Putin to change his calculus, but rather how do we send a strong signal that the US objects to what Russia is doing? Um, which, in my view, is important, but not necessarily the best use of sanctions and actual legal measures. Um, and so, you know, you, what you see is, I think, these more sort of I apologize for the phrase, but clunky measures uh, that really name specific companies in the bill um, that you know potentially withdraw waivers from the administration, um, and I think you know I, I certainly see what what Congress is trying to do um, in response to you know in light of Helsinki, uh, you know I, I certainly don't mean to downplay the concern over the over the president's actions. Um, but there are sort of broader interests at stake here um, of using these sanctioned measures in a way that violates sort of these long-held principles, such as you know uh, we we impose sanctions based on an administrative record created by OFAC or the State Department in order to protect them legally to provide the necessary due process. Um, we create sanctions in a way to tell the private sector what we expect them not to do. Uh, to actually deter that activity uh, very specifically, um, and so I think I think you know there is a there is a great concern about using these more clunky measures. Uh, they may send a strong message to the president, uh, but at the same time they may actually undermine the effectiveness uh, of the sanctions and their legal underpinning uh, by doing so. Now, Dalip, do you uh, do you agree that that we don't see the chain of reaction that that uh, David is talking about in terms of pressuring one thing, which which knocks down the next next thing? Um, and do you um, can you can you walk us through the macro impacts of um, on the financial sector or sovereign debt uh, market? Sure, I, I think David described it perfectly in terms of the um, the conceptual differences between where we were in 2014 and, and where we seem to be now. And let me just add a bit first on, on the kind of principles that we thought were important when we were designing sanctions then because they're still relevant now. I mean, after all, we're, we're in the early part of the process of trying to develop sanctions doctrine as a tool of foreign policy. Um, we've had hundreds of years of thinking about military doctrine, very few years of thinking about sanctions, particularly against large market economies. Uh, so a lot of us who were involved in the design of Russia sanctions thought about what was important. Um, one thing that's important is you have to use sanctions to demonstrate resolve. They have to be taken seriously. Um, and by that I mean you have to design sanctions that have the potential to deliver overwhelming costs. Uh, we thought we had that in place in 2014. The Deter Act certainly checks the box on that principle. <coughs> uh, but a second one is, are, will you be perceived as acting responsibly? And by that I mean, are you taking care to avoid unnecessary harm to the civilian population of your target? Are you taking care to guard against putting US companies, European companies at a competitive disadvantage? Um, are you taking care to maintain a reputation as a, as a trustworthy steward of the global economy? Uh, we, we thought we struck a decent balance in doing that back in 2014 and 2015. Uh, I'm not convinced that the Deter Act uh, comes anywhere close to that in this instance. The third thing is you want to retain optionality. Uh, foreign policy is a repeated game. It's not a one-time shot. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at a bill like the Deter Act, uh, it's quite maximalist. I mean, it's, it's basically throwing everything out there that you can in terms of potential sanctions actions. Um, our, our view is, look, if you design sanctions in stages, you can learn from your previous steps. You can learn how the market reacts. You can gauge how your target responds. <coughs> and then you calibrate your next step based on what you've learned. Um, the other thing that's really important that David mentioned is to try to be coordinated. Why does that matter? Well, number one, it's a force multiplier. Um, the US just taking, taking sovereign debt or financial sector sanctions uh, in particular, 
the U.S. and European firms are the dominant suppliers of financing uh, to sovereign entities and to financial entities. If you move together with Europe, you have a multiplicative effect on your target. But you also have a better chance of controlling the narrative. And you know, that, that's proven to be an area in which Putin has skillfully uh, turned our efforts on their head at times <laughs> by saying to the Russian people, the reason you're in a two-year recession is because of the Americans and not because of my own policy decisions. Um, it's, it's easier to control the narrative when you move together. And the last thing is they have to be sustainable. Th these are not, these don't tend to be actions that produce the desired change in behavior on T plus one. They take time. And, and that's another reason why you want to build pressure over time. Um, I can come back and speak at length about what exactly would happen with some of the um, sanctions on the financial sector, but basically they're all different degrees of creating a capital account shock. When you remove the U.S. as a supply of financing to a heavily indebted company or to a, an indebted sovereign, you're raising its borrowing cost, you're reducing its qu credit quality, you're inducing capital flight, that's going to pressure the currency weaker. If the currency is pressured weaker, that tends to generate inflation. If there's inflation, that reduces domestic purchasing power, and you get a recession. The question is, how do you want to turn the dial? How, how deep of a recession do you want to create? And that's all in the art of diplomacy. It's not a mechanical thing. All right, let's, let's dig into some of the geopolitics and some of the energy impacts. Um, so if, if um, for instance, Gazprom, Rosneft, or, or Luke Oil are mentioned in the bill, does that mean that U.S. companies or international Western oil companies cannot continue their joint ventures with them? Um, and furthermore, does it mean that, um, does it also apply to third countries, for in instance, Venezuela, um, and, and, and that kind of thing? Sure. Uh, um, I think the problem with the Deter Act in particular is that it's not clear whether it supersedes CATSA or, or how it works with it. So that's exactly the risk. One is if you essentially can't do business with Luke Oil or Rosneft or Gazprom, then if you're in a joint venture with them you know, in Russia, as many U.S. companies are, then the risk is that you are forced out you know, at perhaps fire sale prices and then the Russians backfill or the Chinese backfill or some non-U.S. company backfills there and then what have you gained? You've sort of, you've, you've punished a U.S. company um, and you've reduced U.S. influence but you haven't actually hurt the production or, or the Russians. So that's a serious risk um, for investments in Russia. Um, it's also, if you can't ship on Russian rail because that's a state-owned company, you can't do business with them, then um, there can be some severe third country effects. One is that you essentially strand Kazakhstan because if you can't move crude oil out of Kazakhstan, if you can't move sulfur or LPG out of Kazakhstan, essentially either you can't produce oil or you lock them in. So Kazakhstan ends up getting punished because the U.S. companies can't operate their, their businesses there. Um, you also create this um, unique power for the Russians in that if they are in a joint venture now, or if they're in a joint venture with a U.S. company in the future, they can be the poison pill that forces the U.S. company out. So um, if, you're, if you're currently in a project, as U.S. companies are in Africa or, say, in Venezuela, um, and you're not allowed to be in that because there's no waiver or there's no, you know, there's no exception for that, then you've got to get out. And frankly, if a government like the Venezuelans decides they want to push the U.S. companies out of something, all they have to do is invite the Russians in and then the U.S. company is forced by law to get out. So it's, it's reverse. It actually shifts the power, I think, to the, to the Russians to punish U.S. companies rather than the objective of the bill, which is to, which is to do it in the, in the other direction. Um, I think the other, you know, the other challenge that you have is on the pipelines. So um, CASA was very careful to try and distinguish between transit pipelines and export pipelines. So if you know, you're shipping across CPC or trying to get Kazakh oil out, um, you didn't want to punish that line. Um, but essentially, the Escape Act is kind of indiscriminate with respect to how it treats pipelines. So you run this risk of not being able to, to move, uh, move hydrocarbons across the country. Um, and so that's a challenge. And then you have maybe the, the oil market impacts. So I'm, I'm completely sympathetic to the goal of the Deterra bill, which is set a red line for Russia, make it clear if they cross it that they get punished. But you know this is a blunt instrument, and 
And I think if the administration were inclined to come up with its own list of punishments, banning people, denial of exports of relevant technologies, visas, designating more people, the Congress wouldn't feel so compelled to use a club to do what it feels the administration is not doing. And that's why we are where we are. <laughs> but, um, but it is a, a clumsy instrument. And when you wrap all those effects together, forcing US companies out, allowing backfill, not having a waiver, essentially you know, making, making the Russians a, a poison pill, with no ability to, to adjust that, um, then what you're really doing is, uh, is, is punishing more of US investment. Um, and you're not necessarily affecting the Russian calculus much at all. So how do, we talked about this a bit earlier, but how do, how, as lawyers, how do you uh, how do you uh, it, um, how do you talk to clients about um, what the risks are? I mean, it, David's painting a picture of some pretty big risks. Um, so for energy companies looking at, at Nord Stream two um, and this legislation, how how do you navigate that? Well, the first thing I would say <coughs> is that if we're reduced to judging the merits of sanctions policy by, through the eyes of lawyers, we're really, really in trouble. Uh, you know, this is a, it's a big, uh, but these are the questions we get every day, and you know, it's part of a bigger question of risk management. So on the U.S. side, uh, you know, there are uh, companies uh, doing business in, in Russia, but also uh, in areas around the world where there may be joint exploration and production uh, <coughs> uh, projects either with uh, a Russian participant as part of a consortium or next door in, a, in the same field which uh, fields which in many cases are unitized meaning there's a lot of shared infrastructure and access to the hydrocarbons under, underground uh, so uh, those companies, you know, were, are in direct targets here, uh, and so there's significant risk. On the pipelines, uh, <coughs> like Nord Stream 2 uh, or CPC, I mean, there are various kinds of participants there, but the European companies, I think, are the ones who, you know, are particularly uh, should be concerned about the Barroso approach. Uh, because there, there are companies that have already significant investments or are thinking of committing to the next phase of that project. Uh, they supply goods and services. Uh, so it's, um, uh, you know, for, for a German or a French or UK or <coughs> Eastern European company where it's right next door, you have a different look. The final thing I would say is um, one of the ca things that I don't know how you ever ca uh, gauge the risk or calculus of this, but the Deter Act is full of blocking actions. I mean, we would seize assets and block them in the United States of all these entities that may be associated with Russian uh, persons. <coughs> uh, there's a lot of U.S. investment in Russia still, uh, and, and so in terms of exposure and risk, you know, one of the questions is, does the Ford manufacturing plant or the International Harvester plant or whatever it is in Russia gets seized uh, in retaliation. Now that's probably counterproductive for the Russians in terms of their own economy, but uh, you know we're, we're talking about very uh, 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 wide range of risks. So I, d I agree with everything Ted said. I'd just make two additional points um, with my, my lawyer's hat, which is I think, uh, you know, I think what we're seeing, the, the problems we're seeing under CATSA and, and potentially now under Deter Act and the other legislation are, are twofold. And, and the first is um, the secondary sanctions, um, what are they? Um, what are they actually trying to do? If you look historically, even how Congress has used secondary sanctions, certainly how the administration has done, it is telling foreign companies, don't do this or the United States uh, may restrict your access to our market. Right? It is intended to deter the activity that is laid out very specifically. Right? And you saw this in the growth of sanctions on Iran. It was you know, investments over certain financial thresholds in Iran energy sector. It was the export of refined petroleum to Iran over certain financial thresholds. Very, very specific. And obviously that grew over time. And foreign companies knew, even without any nexus, okay, that activity I'm engaged, there's a serious risk I'm going to end up under U.S. sanctions. And also it was a very uh, clear message as diplomats, Treasury, State, tra tra travel around the world to say, 
companies, if you engage in this, you may be sanctioned by the United States. Um, and the vast majority of companies said, well, then we're not touching it. Um, and it was very effective, deterrent. Uh, I think Katza really departs from that because it seems to attempt to give the administration a lot of authorities, uh, such as sanctioning anyone who facilitates any transaction, a significant transaction, uh, with a Russian person subject to sanctions. But these are authorities the administration already has. And the authorities are so broad uh, that it does not, it does not make, uh, send a very clear message. It certainly sends a message of concern and worry uh, and risk, but it's not sent a very clear message to foreign companies. We, the US government, expect you to halt this activity. Now, Treasury and State attempted to improve upon that with guidance that they issued, uh, I believe, in January. Uh, and that did help a lot clarify, but it, it still is a, is a very muddled message, especially as you said. Uh, no one's actually been sanctioned under these authorities, so there's, there's very little in the way of, of guideposts. And so, you know, that dilutes the effect of U.S. secondary sanctions, because if we come out with a new threat, foreign companies look at this and they say, well, this is just Congress talking to the president. You know, they're not coming after us. We don't need to worry about them. And then U.S. sanctions are not effect an effective deterrent. Um, and I think, uh, I think that, that really needs to be considered in terms of building on, on CATSA and the problems uh, CATSA had. I think the other issue is, uh, again, it's a lot of authorities. It's a lot of uh, the administration shall do this if it makes certain determinations. Um, but I think Congress, you know, in terms of actually having an impact on, on Russia, uh, and in terms of, again, the restrictions on US companies and, and the deterrent foreign companies that I talk to day to day, the most effective thing Congress can be doing is, is looking at what, not what the president says, but what also, in addition, what the administration is doing and what OFAC is doing. And some of these measures that OFAC has actually put in place, including the April 6 designations of, um, of the three oligarchs and their companies have been extremely significant in terms of the activity that's now prohibited, but without having a dramatic spillover impact on, on broader energy prices, um, yes, on aluminum prices, but they're, they're trying to fix that, uh, but no, not the broader impact on, on the global economy and on energy prices in particular. Um, and I think you know, th there's a lot in that sort of neighborhood that uh, Congress could be working with the administration to do and encourage under CATSA, under existing authorities, um, to actually have an impact on Russia. Looking, for example, to the classified version of the 241 report, the oligarch report that went up to the Hill. Not the public list, which we all know seems to be taken from Forbes, but, uh, but the classified version that actually described the, the, the network of corruption and those involved um, in nefarious activities around Putin in Russia. Um, there's a lot more that could be done there. And so I think it is, it is um, you know, Congress would be wise to, to build on uh, what OFAC has been trying to do uh, under CATSA rather than simply eclipse it with these bigger and broader authorities that is going to send an even more muddled message to the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, so let's look at the impact on, inter you, you mentioned aluminum markets, but in terms of the oil markets, um, right now we've, uh, Brent prices have been in the mid-70s uh, per barrel despite, um, you know, despite this plan by Saudi Arabia and Russia to put a considerable amount of oil back onto the market. Um, and Obviously, the oil market appears to be um, still concerned about the Iran sanctions coming up in uh, November, early November. With, um, so, what? Um, so, if if new sanctions on Russia do manage to take oil or gas off the market, what what could that do for the prices? Well, they go up. Um, I guess if they were really uh, really effective with. Um, with Iran coming off the market, and who knows whether that's really going to be going to, to zero or not, and Venezuela in rapid decline, you already have that upward pressure. There's a school of thought that perhaps we're actually looking at a crash in prices next year because there'll be an oversupply. But, um, but if you truly were able to take that Russian supply off and not replace it, spare capacity is pretty close to zero. You write a lot about this yourself, so you may be able to, to answer your, yeah. your own question. Uh, well, the Saudis and, and the Russians are the, um, the main source of spare capacity right now. Um, and so um, that is the, the OPEC and non-OPEC uh, allies are, are, are um, trying to put a million, up to a million barrels per day back um, into oil supply and into the market. Um, to account for Venezuela and Iran, so 
and you do have that, that, then that ironic effect, which is their supply may be decreased, but to the extent they can get it out, they're earning more revenue from it. Right, and we've, right. had that, we've had that challenge before. So it would be pretty significant, especially if it was um, a permanent um, loss of supply. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, the other risk that you have is that we really wouldn't be able to enforce it. The Russians would keep their projects. They would just kick the Americans out. Uh, and then you would still have some of that price risk and putting upward pressure out. And the, the Russians might actually profit from the whole enterprise rather than, than suffering from it. What could happen to Chinese investment in the energy sector? Well, I think we're seeing that, that backfill already. And of course, in Iran and other cases, Chinese backfill has, been, has always been an issue. They don't have the same exposure in the US. Um, and so their ability to, to step in, certainly as equity investors, um, probably more than operators, is pretty significant. So it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a, you know, a free pass that you give to the Chinese to just buy in at whatever rate the Russians want to want to sell to them. So that's a significant risk. You know, the the other point, just by that you alluded to, is you know the sanctions so far haven't really had much an effect on Russian production, and that was by design. You know, going in with the Europeans, we didn't want to drive up gas prices, we didn't want to drive up oil prices. So all the sanctions affect the future of Russian production, which really lies in either offshore um, or in unconventionals because they have huge resources there. And so if you look at sort of the forward curve of Russian production, they're probably at a peak now and going down, but you're not feeling the pain, the pain right now. And I think that's where a lot of the frustration comes from. So yesterday, uh, President Trump had a joint press conference with the Italian uh, president, and he said um, just one very short sentence, um, Russian sanctions will, would, quote, remain as is. Um, so you know, given that we've, we've come a couple of weeks from the Helsinki summit, um, has the temperature cooled at all? Um, has it cooled enough to, to take off some of this pressure from, from Congress? Um, do you see, do you, do you see um, do you actually think one of these bills will get passed? Um, it, who would like to take that? I think it, I think it has cooled. Uh, I think the White House actually did a very effective job of cooling the temperature. Um, as cynical as it may sound, the president's tweet about there was Russian meddling, but they're hoping the Democrats, um, I meant to say wouldn't rather than would, or whichever way around it was, uh, you know, as, as sort of um, half-hearted as those may seem, I think they actually were effective in sending the signal to the Republicans, at least in Congress, all right, the White House gets it. Helsinki was uh, not quite the message we should have sent. I would add also, you, this goes to your earlier question about risk management. If you're a company abroad or even in the US trying to assess the risk, the likelihood of this happening, I think one of the first, one of the first two questions you ask is, what are these recent bills about? What's their purpose? Uh, is it election interference in the U.S.? Is it continuing occupation of Crimea? I mean, it's, you know, the Barrasso bill does its, is, you know, it's about exports of LNG from the U.S. Uh, but the most important thing is they, this, this is all in the last couple of weeks, right? I mean, there were some bills out there. They were going nowhere. They had two sponsors. Now they have three. You know, the, uh, is Senator Van Hollen and Senator Rubio really a, a great bipartisan force for advancing U.S. policy in Russia, or is, are there other things going on there with their, their bills? So, I, you know, at the end, are these bills really about U.S. politics as opposed to policy involving Russia? And if you think it's U.S. politics, then you may think that the chances are not real high that anything is going to get through Congress. Yeah, I mean, if we just, if we just take the Deter Act, it's trying to deter something that arguably is already happening. There is, you know, <laughs> if you read press reporting, already election interference taking place in certain states. So the question is, are we going to respond in a way that's maximalist, or are we going to respond in a way that's proportionate and gives us staying power? I think that's the real question. Well, I'm a little less sanguine, I guess, because uh, while it's, it's August, I think the, um, you know, uh, there'll be hearings the end of August um, and maybe the beginning of September on the bill. You have a lot of members of Congress who are concerned about this in different ways. And the big concern is the election is coming up, right? There is interference going on already. So what are we going to do if that happens? What are we going to, what's our response going to be? And with the president saying that there might be interference, but it's, it's meant to help the Democrats because they really don't want Trump, that credibility administration's position is weak. So. Um, so I think um, you can never discount, you know, some defense bill or spending bill which has to pass going and everyone agreeing on that one measure 
which is going to, they're going to tag on to that bill to make things move. And so I think the more we see signs of Russian interference in the election, the more that's going to be a freight train that no member of Congress is going to want to stand in front of. So it's not clear which it will be, and yeah. the hearings already are pointing towards uh, improving enforcement of CATSA. So um, if you see something for the administration which looks credible, maybe that will cool it. But if you see more signs of interference from the Russians and you see no credible administration response, it is a non-negligible risk that one of these elements will get latched onto something and, and pass soon. Um, if you guys could all get some questions ready, we'll open it up to you in a, in a second. One more question, um, just a quick one on, um, so when CATSA passed, President Trump signed signed it, but issued a statement saying it was, quote, seriously flawed. Um, and, and he had a pretty lengthy statement about it and that, that despite its problems, I'm signing this for the sake of national unity. So if, if, Congress has manages to, if Congress manages to pass one of these bills, do you expect a similar protest from the White House? Yes, but I don't think it matters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the question, would he veto it is the question. And, uh, I, you know, I think the president's statement last August was very consistent with the position of every president of every administration on sanctions, which is maximum discretion needs to be retained in the executive branch because sanctions as a tool uh, are not very effective if they're locked into law. I mean, the president has to be able to respond to positive reactions from the, tar you know, the uh, target of the sanctions, uh, and do it in fairly short order. Uh, if you end up like Cuba with the regulations written into law, then you have very limited ability to respond to positive things. So I, I interpreted the president's remarks last August as consistent with that long-standing view of the executive branch. But. I think, you can, I think you can dig up uh, <laughs> dig up some statements on the Iran uh, legislation from when we were in government as yes. well. <laughs> right. All right, we'll start right here. Next one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Svetlana Rikhova Tibets. Um, I have Tibets Historical Foundation, Tibets News Service. Uh, the first mark, uh, two weeks ago, Helsinki. Uh, Trump spent $14 million to participate. Uh, Putin brought 50 f $54 million to, to participate in this meeting in Helsinki. Then, uh, the question, who owns the Central Bank of Russia? To my mind, the Great Britain. Then, uh, the third, that if Russia will finish to sell um, oil, they will sell water through these pipes. It is a plan. And then uh, the review of sanctions shows that the, the sanctions do not work. That's why it's better maybe to find uh, some more smart solutions than sanctions, because uh, I covered the White House since 1996. And Sarah McLennan, who covered the Congress in the uh, White House for 55 years, she brought me to the uh, press room of the White House. That's why, to my mind, it is necessary to live in contemporary world uh, to invite more, uh, more people who are professionals in the Russian business. That's all. Thank you. Take a couple. Are sanctions effective? I mean, it, it's, <laughs> uh, we've talked a little bit about this, but um, what is it required to make sanctions effective? Well, I, I think in some cases they are. Even the, uh, the sanctions that are in place now have led to a serious uh, diminution in, in investment in Russia. So you've seen, you know, you've seen uh, Exxon essentially leave a significant part of its activities there. Um, you're not seeing significant investment in the Russian offshore. You're not seeing it in unconventionals. They don't have really the technology to do it on their own. So I think that has had an effect. You saw an effect uh, on the ruble. It actually made it cheaper to produce oil in Russia, so that was kind of an unintended consequence. <laughs> uh, but I think in terms of cutting off that future, it has, it has worked. Um, whether it has worked for the primary intended purpose, which is stopping uh, intervention in our elections, and I think there the answer is is no. But maybe we need a, a better and different tool. Yeah. So I'm going to, if I can add to that, yeah. I'm going to offer a personal Please. theory, which is, um, as probably some people in this room have already heard me argue, I, I think I think the sanctions on Russia have been effective, but you know, you've got to actually consider what their intended goal was, right? I mean, also, sanctions by themselves don't achieve anything. Sanctions are leverage in order to change behavior in order to obtain a diplomatic solution. So that's, that's the place you've got to start. 
But I think the sanctions have been effective, uh, at least with respect to Ukraine, in changing the calculus for Putin. And for every step, you know, certainly, certainly within those first couple of years, every step that Putin took in Ukraine, he had to consider, what will this cost me? What will this cost the Russian economy? What will this cost those close to me in my circle? What will it cost their assets, their companies? And he had to consider that. And that had to be part of his decision-making calculus. And th there is some, there's some anecdotal evidence to that. And the one I always cite is, you know, Putin, I believe, calculated his steps very carefully to avoid backlash from Europe. And he realized how far he could go without uh, a European consensus on strong sanctions measures. And he did that quite effectively because you can see on July 16, 2014, when the first time the United States imposed sectoral sanctions, we had a small list of banks, small list of energy companies, it was just the United States. Europe did not come along. And then the one moment that Ukraine, the events in Ukraine got out of Putin's hands were the next day, July 17th, when MH17 was shot down. And a week later, Europe came along with us, and the United States expanded, and we matched our two measures. Uh, I think it was even during um, the, the meeting of, of the rest of the G7 in Brussels. Um, and you know, I think that demonstrated that Putin was trying to get as close to the line as possible without going over it. Um, but I think certainly the sanctions have been effective in changing the calculus before him. Let me just, let me just yeah. foot stomp. There, sanctions are not meant as a standalone tool, but they are effective when they're part of a coherent and unified strategy. They can work. Under Oslo and the Atlantic Council, I have two questions. One primarily for Dalip. Uh, you uh, uh, volunteered to develop uh, uh, these new financial sanctions that uh, uh, are in the various bills, what they would mean to sanction the sovereign debt and to undertake other financial uh, sanctions. And then I wonder who would volunteer to discuss uh, what is happening to Rusal and EN Plus right now. What is your lesson for you? US sanctions from that incident. Thank you. So uh, thanks, Andres, for the question. I, mean, I, I think there are ways to sanction sovereign debt that shouldn't scare us. Um, yes, it's the risk-free asset of the country. Yes, it has spillover effects when you change the value of that risk-free asset. Um, but you don't have to go as far as the Deter Act uh, to, to get in the business of restricting sovereign debt markets. For example, um, you could require disclosures of sovereign debt holdings from US investors or European investors. Now that has a potent signaling effect. You haven't actually done anything uh, that prevents US investors or US businesses from risk managing their Russian exposures. But you've made it pretty clear we're thinking about this. If you were to prohibit transactions in sovereign debt, uh, you could focus on new purchases rather than covering all transactions. And that way you allow for sales of sovereign debt to occur as investors become uh, more cognizant of the risks involved. Uh, you could focus on, uh, you could focus on long-term sovereign debt as your choice of prohibition, which would force Russia to issue shorter and shorter maturities and increase uh, the financial risks of their balance sheet. The point is there are lots of different ways to enter into restrictions on sovereign debt that have meaningful impact without the same kind of spillovers uh, that would likely occur with some of the legislation we've seen. Can you pass the mic down to the Is the impact on Russell? A name plot? Oh, Russell. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I mean, I think we'll find out by October, right? <laughs> um, what the impact will be. I mean, we've seen, um, we've seen, you know, Renova divested very, or Salsa, I should say, bought back those those Renova shares very quickly to get out of the the effect of sanctions. And I think from the U.S. perspective, you know, these divestments, uh, right? So just to back up here a little, we're talking about the fact that if these companies who are owned by designated persons. Uh, if, if the investment goes below 50%, then those entities are no longer uh, owned uh, and, and blocked as a matter of law. 
um, uh, by by the uh, um, by the individuals, and if they if they are no longer owned and no longer controlled, then presumably they would be delisted by uh, OFAC from the SDN list. So, you know, we we've seen um, the extension of these general licenses to allow for further uh, maintenance and wind down of activities uh, until October um, for for many of, of the entities um, that were owned by the designated individuals from April. Uh, and I think the big open question, uh, which I don't know the answer to, is will they divest uh, and relinquish control of these, of these entities by October? Uh, and if they do not, I think we're actually going to see some pretty significant impacts on certain U.S. businesses um, and, and these entities as well as their U.S. assets uh, become blocked. Now, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's going to have uh, long-term macro consequences um, you know, it just may result in a lot of phone calls for, uh, for Ted and myself. Uh, hi there, Yuval Weber of Ken Institute, Daniel Morgan Graduate School. This is a question about the Escape the Barrasso Bill. So before President Tr so the Nord Stream project has been going on a decade, if not longer. It's sort of a, it's a big deal. Um, and so when President Trump was meeting with uh, NATO leaders, he attacked uh, Angela Merkel about this, saying that it would make uh, Germany a captive of Russia. And I thought, I think, and many people thought it was just a way to attack her personally and just keep up that rivalry. But then at the actual Helsinki press conference, um, President Trump really talked about uh, the dangers of Nord Stream 2, but also the potential of American LNG exporters. Now, in your sort of opinions, uh, how much of this uh, Escape Act, uh, President Trump's rhetoric, is about maybe Reagan era uh, making sure that Soviet pipelines don't come into Europe? And how much of this is making an entree for American LNG exporters to get into Europe itself? I'm happy to take the, the first run at that. Um, I think there is a, a you know a, a good deal of export promotion in the president's rhetoric, you know, kind of worldwide. And the Barrasso bill would give not would give NATO allies you know preferential access to U.S. LNG. There's lots of U.S. LNG for sale if anybody's interested in in buying it. So I don't think any special preferences are really required. I think it represents a, a little bit of a misguided understanding of the way the market works. I mean, the, the European gas market is contestable. There are LNG import terminals. And U.S. LNG, in fact, puts a cap, essentially, on what the Russians can charge. First from the shale gale and now from, you know, from Henry Hub pricing, they can't price discriminate in the way that they could before. So that's a positive, that's sort of a positive thing. Uh, so, uh, I, so I think there is some export promotion there. Um, it is a little bit of the Reagan era. It's long-standing U.S. policy that Europe is better off with diversity. Happiness is multiple pipelines. Ambassador Morton started spent his career on this, you know, on, on this issue. And so, um, so, and Nord Stream 2 is an unnecessary pipeline. It's moving the same amount of gas, but it's just moving it directly to Germany instead of moving it through Ukraine. And it's designed for Russia to mitigate its own transit risk. So it is unnecessary from a supply point of view. Um, and if European policy is meant to make the market more competitive, then giving Russians more control is probably not consistent with that. So that's why U.S. policy, Democratic and Republican administrations, has opposed Nord Stream 2 as being unnecessary. But the goal, I think, as you heard from, you know, from Dilip and from, Ed, from David, you know, the, the goal of this policy is not kill that pipeline. The goal of the policy is essentially to protect Ukraine. It's to provide energy security for Ukraine. If you can come up with another solution that will provide transit security, that might be uh, understandable. So, so I think the president's right to call uh, Merkel out on being inconsistent with European policy. Uh, but I think the idea that he's going to solve this by more U.S. LNG is probably naive. Ambassador. Just one quick point on the LNG. Uh, question and LNG exports to Europe. One, and it, I think <coughs> that is part of the, certainly part of the narrative, but I also don't think we should forget that Europeans begged, have been begging for our LNG uh, for years. I mean, when both of us were in the government and meeting with Europeans, when are we going to get more LNG? When are we going to get more LNG? And <coughs> I don't think we should forget that. I will ask a question that you can't answer, uh, which <laughs> is, where are we going to be a year from now? Uh, it's a question you can't answer, but it does probably, you may want to try and answer, but 
<coughs> it relates to, I think, what one of the most important issues is, which, one, which would be, how do you manage risk? And you got into that, you got into that a little bit. But the question, looking out from a year, there's going to be a whole lot of events that are going to happen. We have our elections. What's the Russian interference going to be? Uh, um, what's the Mueller investigation <coughs> going to find? We, it's virtually impossible to predict where we'll be a year from now and which of, the, which of these pieces of legislation will pass and what, what the effects will be. Will it destroy our whole sanctions regime with Euro the Europeans backing off and going on their own, you know, their own way with, <coughs> uh, with Russia or what? But it seems to me that from an investor standpoint, to adv and tell me if you would agree with this, I guess I would tell an investor, it's obviously a business decision, but put as little money into these projects as possible uh, over the next year. Uh, manage, you know, manage that risk so that if things do go bad, that your exposure <coughs> will be less, and then let's see what happens over the following year. Uh, as if some, I mean, would you all agree with that, or what do you think will happen in a year, if you have any <laughs> ideas? Well, I, I guess I would say, uh, who, know, who knows? I mean, uh, this time next year, we could be hosting President Putin on a visit. <laughs> or our president could be in Moscow. Uh, we could have peace with North Korea and Syria, and the Iran sanctions will have changed, and so there's no more secondary sanctions pressure on Europe. I mean, there's so many variables. You know, in general, capital is a coward, as they say. It'll move to the safest, less, least risky spots. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if there's just a sort of treading water for the next year. I'd just say, if you, between the Mueller investigation coming to some conclusion, our midterm elections, the beginning of the next presidential campaign, you may not know what's going to happen, but that risk profile is going up, not down. Anybody else? I, I, I agree. It's much easier to see a tighter sanctions regime than a grand bargain that would loosen up sanctions on Russia, whether it's because of Mueller, whether it's because of a geopolitical provocation by Putin in the non-NATO near abroad. You can go on and on about the scenarios um, that are negative. It's hard for me to see a coming together on, on Syria, on Ukraine, on other issues of shared importance that would unlock a better path. And I will just add to, to echo a point Ted made earlier. I think the trajectory will be towards the political rather than the policy. All right, second row. Elaine Sereo, Associate Rector of UACU in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, my question has to do with uh, the cy Russian cyber invasion. There's been a focus of the cyber invasion on the, the elections, both 2016 and the upcoming election. But there's not been much said about the uh, cyber invasion uh, of Russia into our infrastructure, specifically energy and power. How do you see that attacks, which there's been indications have already occurred, uh, how do you see that playing out with sanctions in, in the present sanctions and the future development of sanctions, as if we see an uptick in that cyber invasion? Thank you. Right, it's not just elections. Right. We're talking <laughs> I mean, utilities. Um, right, well, I guess both at the end of the Obama administration and at the beginning of this one, um, you know, there was a lot of work done interagency on, uh, on, a, on a national cyber policy, um, largely a Department of Homeland Security. And there have been, I think, as you point out, numerous, you know, uh, unsuccessful attacks, but nonetheless attempts to hack both nuclear facilities and, and electric plants. You know, what we don't really have now is the same kind of deterrence policy in cyber the way we do, you know, in other areas where it makes it clear that that kind of an attack, you know, is going to be seen, you know, as an attack, uh, you know, as sort of a, an act of war. Um, and I think the more it bring, brings us back to if so, then what happens when you cross that line? But I think um, the, the, the rules right now really is that you don't counter a cyber attack with another cyber attack. But that's not permitted under international law. But I think that's where you might see things change, is whether we might go from you know, less overt to more overt means of uh, responding to cyber attacks on us with cyber attacks in response. I would just say, I mean, it, Putin has 
mastered the art of hybrid war. Information, energy, elections, so on and so forth. And our sanctions regime needs to catch up in terms of fleshing out uh, a, a broad and deep escalation ladder so that we can respond proportionately to events that don't have an obvious, that don't remind us of an obvious precedent. We yeah. don't have that yet. I'll just add, you know, there has been some response in the sense of the indictments of the 2021 uh, Federal Security Service officers uh, connected to the cyber attacks. It is an interesting question, though, what resonates in the minds of the American people more, an attack on infrastructure or the noise about the election? Uh, and I don't actually know the answer to that, but I do think this asymmetry point that David made is is also part of the conundrum. We we don't respond, or at least we don't talk about what we do. I don't know why the, you know, others are so, you know, flagrantly showing what their capabilities are. But it's a it's a dilemma. I think there's the intent to play down the attack on our infrastructure systems because that is an that is a concrete invasion mm -hmm. of structures. So. And also, I think I just want to add, with with respect to both the the election interference and the uh, and the, the potential cyber attacks, other cyber attacks, um, it seems so strange to put all our eggs in the sanctions basket, uh, right? And and you know, from a sanctions perspe perspective, it seems strange for both the administration and Congress to be turning to sanctions first, right? And and I think what's more worrying is, uh, you know, we we've seen Congress in the last week uh, cut funding for uh, preventing, not deterring, but preventing uh, interference in, in elections. Uh, we've seen public reports of the president holding a 30-minute NSC on, uh, on election interference with, with no concrete conclusions or, or instructions to the interagency. Um, and you know, for Congress then to simply spit out another sanctions bill um, that says, well, well, we'll threaten sanctions if they do this, um, seems, seems a, a tiny sliver uh, of, of the tools actually available to Congress and the administration. What are the tools that are being under Oh, well, <laughs> like I said, I'm the sanctions guy. I, yeah. I, so, okay. you know, I'm no, I'm no cyber expert. Um, but, you know, obviously the funding needs to be there. Uh, obviously, clear instructions from the president needs to be there um, for the administration to really respond wholeheartedly uh, to these threats. Hello, Kristen Shergate with the Caspian Policy Center, so you can probably gauge where I'm going with this question. <laughs> um, so we got Gazprom going into Turkmenistan. We have Gazprom touching TANAP and TAP. We have Luke Oil that just announced that they are going to be developing a Caspian oil and gas field, um, as well as um, as well as just uh, Kazakhstan. You, Mr. Uh, you saying that mm. Kazakhstan's basically screwed if this happens. Let's say the sanctions do happen. Russia has the ability to just kick the U.S. out. They have already had their feet everywhere in the Caspian region. What can U.S. companies do to strengthen their ties in the Caspian region in the oil and gas sector if this does happen? Well, uh, it's good that you mentioned TANAP. That's another in instance where Luke Oil is in TANAP, and you wouldn't want to undermine the ability to, to, to pursue that line uh, because Luke Oil is in the U.S. companies have to get out. Uh, well, a Again, with Ambassador Morningstar here, having spent a lot of time trying to talk the Turkmen and others into, you know, uh, creating uh, frameworks which would allow U.S. companies to explore for gas and ship it someplace else, uh, a lot of it falls on the countries themselves. But one thing we can do is diplomacy, which is really to to not let the kind of attention we had to Caspian unity and Caspian export pipelines languish in the way that it has so far. Um, the quieter we are the more insecure those nations are and the more they, they look to Russia because they don't know whether the U.S. will be there. Um, I think the second would be to encourage them you know, to have frameworks which would make it more welcoming for, for U.S. investment. Um, um, but a lot of Turkmenistan in particular is looking to China really more than, uh, more than any place else. Um, and the other is to make the, the European gas market um, competitive and contestable so that there's a place for that gas if they want it to, to export it there. Just to further add to that, I think it's really important in whatever 
legislation does get enacted, that proper consideration be taken for projects like <coughs> the uh, Jacques Denis project, the TANAP pipeline, and TAP. It's been 20 years of American policy that we want alternative routes and al coming, you know, coming from the Caspian, and to lose that, to lose that because Luke Oil owns 10%. Uh, would be, I think, a very serious mistake. We recognized that on the original Iran Sanctions Act exempting uh, gas coming from the Caspian even though the Iranian National Oil Company owned ten, it was a passive 10 percent investor. So uh, this is just something. I mean, one of the problems that you've alluded to, <coughs> all the unforeseen, either foreseeable and or unforeseen consequences uh, by this legislation. And it's too easy to just sort of strike out, you know, strike back and say, oh, the Russians have done this, so therefore we have, you know, very overly simplified sanctions bill. Uh, we have to be able to look at these consequences and take them into consideration, I think. Can I, uh, I'd like to expand your question a little bit beyond pipelines because uh, there's a tremendous amount of potential infrastructure development that's not just pipelines, it's ports, it's other things that U.S. companies are participating in, would like to participate in. Uh, the Deter Act could hit them, uh, as well as uh, the existing sanctions already, in some cases are, with the SDN designations. Um, and that is an area that the U.S. government in a different hand, through OPIC is, uh, and through legislation that's been in the Congress, trying to ramp up U.S. government support for U.S. companies, uh, you know, whether it's the uh, uh, Caspian area or the, uh, uh, through Central Asia, you know, support for U.S. companies to counter the growing influence of China elsewhere. So you ask what can be done, I think, you know, there's, the administration should be attuned to this, uh, the potential negative impacts on that effort. And, and by the way, that, you know, in terms of as long as we're involved in Afghanistan supplying troops, it's got to go through the Caspian, right? I think we have time for one more question. I, I, I think I'll address this to David. Uh, I appreciated uh, your narrative uh, about the earlier sanctions being well designed, but overall, as you said yourself, uh, President Putin has shown himself extremely clever in working around sanctions or, or turning their effect uh, to the opposite of what we hoped they'd be. Uh, and he's very proud himself to constantly remind the world, for instance, the agriculture, um, the sanctions on the agriculture, formerly they were importing food, now they're a big exporter of food, so forth and so on. Um, and so uh, an, an, another narrative could say actually sanctions have sort of been a disaster. When you look at the, uh, the broader picture of the reconfiguration of the world scene, um, for instance, the BRICS conference, the SCO, the this, the that. Um, uh, so uh, given that possible way of looking at things, w one might be extremely uh, worried about attempts to uh, make sanctions work by, uh, you know, just going hog wild uh, compared to what they were originally. Um, and, and also the latest trend is, I'm asking, that I picked up at uh, CSIS or here, is the turn to, you know, the oligarchs. And you see the same, the, the corrupt oligarch, the corrupt system, and you see the same thing in Pompeo's speech about Iran, the same, you know, dis disclosing uh, corruption at the highest levels in Iran and making that public, to try and, you know, create a knowledge and a populace of, of who's running the show. But, but nevertheless, it's, um, it seems to be uh, sanctions 2.0 go after the oligarchs and you know as as you described so i think that's all a sign that the original ones didn't work as advertised yeah um and and first of all i think you know that there's completely valid criticism of, of elements of what we did in 2014 and and the limits the limits of how successful they've been right and actually not just changing the calculus before putin, but, but changing putin's behavior right that's obviously a completely legitimate point um and so, you know, and, and I think we saw Heather Newitt get in trouble with, with, a, with a talking point she used uh, last year about, about Katza being uh, effective. Um, the, I think, nonetheless, there's still, um, there's still a, a, a couple of things I would, I would say in response to that. Um, I think, you know, number one, the sanctions have still got to be designed around what is, what is the end goal. And, 
you know, I, I wouldn't say that sanctions have been, have been a failure with Russia, but I will say they've been dramatically, the effectiveness has been dramatically diluted by other things going on, by the president's comments on, on Twitter, in Helsinki, in public, uh, most of all. Uh, the inability of the administration, mostly as a result of number one, uh, to uh, get Europe uh, and others to move with us in strong opposition to, uh, uh, to Russia. And number three, the growth in other countries are the same elements we've seen here of uh, senior political figures, even, even leaders of countries that are sympathetic to, to Russia and, and for some reason uh, really think Putin is a, is a lovely guy. Um, and, and so, you know, all those together, and it, it really goes back to the point we made earlier, that sanctions by themselves uh, accomplish very little. They need to be part of a, a comprehensive strategy and, you know, something much more similar to what we saw in Iran with respect to the nuclear program. It wasn't just the sanctions. It was a concerted diplomatic uh, and political effort by the P5 plus one. And with Russia, um, you know, we, we have seen at times we've seen, we've seen a similar approach, but frankly right now the effect of the sanctions is, is dramatically diluted by everything else that is going on. Uh, number, <laughs> number two, um, uh, sorry, your point with respect to the, the oligarchs. You know, I, I think um, you know, that is a, a sort of subset of, of the broader point I just made, which is um, you know, I think the goal is, the goal, I think Treasury's April, action, April 6th action was actually extremely effective and in line in terms of what the, the, the Russia sanctions at, at their base are trying to do, which is, is to, um, uh, and, and which frankly we started to do in March of 2014, right? The, the first, uh, we didn't call them oligarchs, we called them Putin's inner circle, uh, if you go back to all the press releases from the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, the goal was to target Putin's inner circle in order to have them get upset about Putin's actions and put pressure on him, but also to drive away from Putin those who are concerned about being targeted themselves. And, you know, it's, it's I think, I think, you know, the, the administration should continue that approach, and I think April 6th is very, very strong in that direction, although I know there's been some criticism about, uh, from Russia experts, about why certain individuals were selected. But nonetheless, I think that's the right direction to go, and not, not, you know, simply sanction everybody on that 241 report that appeared in Forbes in 2016, because that's simply going to drive, uh, you know, being a rich Russian shouldn't be a, a, a sanctionable offense. It, you, you need the policy behind it to drive people away from Putin and not towards him, which will simply strengthen his hand in the long run. I'll just make one brief comment on that. I agree with everything David said, but I'd also more broadly observe that sometimes sanctions are important to make a statement, you know, whether or not they're instantly effective or not. And what was the alternative you know, a after the incursion into Crimea and e Eastern Ukraine? And as uh, Dalip and, and David in particular uh, articulated so clearly earlier, Russia is just a different kind of target. So there's, there's so many more things to take into account. The second thing is, in terms of trying to make sanctions effective, you have the longstanding dichotomy between primary sanctions and secondary sanctions. And secondary sanctions are actually the, inc you know, that worries me much more than an idea of going after oligarchs, which is a good idea. But uh, there are real limits to the effectiveness of sanctions if they rely heavily on secondary sanctions because you have to have cooperation from your, your, your allies. And we're in a world now where, you know, we've have forced the Europeans out of Iran. Um, and uh, ratcheting up potentially secondary sanctions on uh, uh, Russia, and that's going to be the wave of the future in other sanctions, and that's, that's going to make it harder and harder to make them effective. And can I just, in the spirit of promoting the factual <laughs> record, <laughs> just, 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 <laughs> no. just, just say that you know, what we saw after the 2014 sanctions, we saw a 70% decline in the ruble peak to trough, we saw inflation rise to the mid double digits. We saw an economic recession of three to four uh, percent. We saw a 25 percent depletion of Russia's foreign reserves. I don't think there's any question they delivered economic costs. I think where the discussion 
should be rightly focused is were those economic costs enough to change the behavior of the target? And that's where we, I think, are all saying sanctions by themselves are not enough. Any final thoughts, David? Nope, I think that's well said. Should we get back <laughs> together when Putin comes to town? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hard to measure what.